OK, good morning, everybody. It's um, just gone 10 o'clock, so it's time for us to resume the hearing sessions as part of the examination of the Dover Local Plan. Hopefully everyone can hear and see me OK. Um, I've just had a bit of a technology check and, and everyone seems to be logged in and cameras and microphones working. Um, welcome along for those of you who haven't attended any of the previous sessions that we've been um, having in the um, Council Chamber. Uh, my name is Matthew Birkinshaw and alongside me is my colleague Mr Clive Coyne and we are the inspectors um, appointed by the Secretary of State to hold the examination. Also on the call today is Louise Sinjin Howe. Louise is the programme officer and no doubt you will be in touch with her with, regarding, uh, with regards to attending today's session. If anybody has any questions, queries, especially around the technology and that we've moved to these sessions to Teams this week, please do contact Louise. So she's in the meeting today. Um, but she's also online, so if you have any queries or questions, please feel free to give her a call or drop her an email and she'll um, help you, especially around any technology or any of the issues that you may have. I'll very quickly go through um, some of the sort of housekeeping matters, really. Um, I know that several of you have attended the previous sessions um, in the Council Chamber. What, what we're going to do is we're moving on to sort of the last matters today of the examination and the hearing sessions. As per other sessions, we'll go through the matters, issues and questions document, but there is a bit of a rejig in the order today um, and I'll just briefly explain why. So to start with, we are going to hear um, there was one question that was left over um, from matter three. So matter three was the housing allocations and in particular policy SAP1 and this is um, the Whitfield Urban Expansion. So there's one, there was one matter that we didn't get a chance to discuss and that related to the SANGs and matters of ecology. Obviously fits quite nicely into this session because we're you know, moving on to talk about some of those policies and issues. So what we're gonna do is we're going to hear um, that question in this session first, um, and then we'll probably, we'll probably have a break, see how long that takes. And then um, there's, um, there's one participant, um, Susan Sullivan, who, who was attending yesterday, who had some tech problems. So we'll hear the SANG matter first, um, which is sort of a, a run over from policy SAP1. Uh, probably have a quick break and then we'll go straight to um, Ms Sullivan, who had some problems yesterday. She couldn't quite get the technology to work. Um, so we'll, we'll hear those. So again, that's a bit of a sort of mop up from yesterday. And then we'll go into um, the rest of the matters, issues and questions for today. Um, as I've said on, on other sessions, really, just, just a quick um, health warning from me. Um, yes, we want you to participate. Yes, the hearing is an opportunity to put your points forward and we want to hear those points. Um, but please do stick to the points that you've made in your original representation. So again, if we're talking about a particular policy or a particular site or a particular issue, please do stick to those representations that you have made. Um, in terms of speaking, obviously on the online um, sort of format, if you just use the raise hand function, so you should see that at the top of your screen, you can just sort of raise your hand like that. Um, let me know, that lets me know that you want to speak. Um, I won't go around the sort of table in the same way that I did when we were in the council chamber and get everybody to introduce themselves. But if it's the first time that you're speaking, if you could just let me know who you are, um, if you're acting on behalf of a particular client or a particular um, parish council or residence group, um, that'd be much appreciated rather than trying to go around a virtual table introducing ourselves. But if you do want to speak at any time, use the raise hand function. Either myself or Mr Coyne will bring you into the debate and into discussion at that point. Um, and then once you've finished speaking, again, lower the hand, lower the sort of virtual hand, and then we know the other people um, who want to speak. When you do speak, at that point, can you turn your camera and microphone on? And obviously speak and engage. And then when you finish speaking, can you turn your camera and microphone off? Again, otherwise, um, there's lots of lots of faces on the screen um, and it can become slightly distracting for ourselves. Um, so that's with the exception of the council. So we'll obviously have our camera and microphones on um, pretty much at all times. And again, if I can ask the council, um, and I think they've got um, an advocate for them today as well, it might just be helpful if the council has their, their camera on so that we're not sort of switching backwards and forwards. That's sort of a very quick run through. So I've got to the last day of the of this part of the examination process. So I know that several of you have attended previous sessions. Um, any matters arising from the council before we get going? 
No, nothing from us. No. Jolly good. Right, we'll get going then. So, um, let's say the first matter for today sort of takes us back in time a little bit to week two, I think. Um, and we go back to matter three. Um, so this was the housing sites and issue one, the Dover housing sites. And there was one question within the MIQs, which we didn't get a chance to go through in um, in any great detail. And that's question six. Um, so can the necessary me measures be provided on site to mitigate potential impacts on the SAC? And the council's hearing statement talks about, um, it refers to the habitat regulation assessment, and that makes a recommendation that some suitable alternative natural green space. So when we refer to SANGs, that's what that means. It's referring to alternative natural green space must be provided at the Whitfield urban expansion. So just to kick this topic off then, please, can I just ask someone from the council just to explain to ourselves and, and, and others in the hearing then what the requirements are from the HRA and how they differ from any previous understanding of the issue and the site and in particular any requirements which are set out in the existing SPD please. Yeah thank you good morning I'm Ashley Taylor from the council um yeah so as set out in um the response to um question six the the HRA recommends that um suitable alternative natural green space should be provided on the um at the Whitfield Urban expansion well at you know within the zone of influence um of, of the of the SAC and particularly at um Whitfield Urban expansion um given the scale of that development um the the recommendations of the HRA then follow through into the requirements of um, SAP1, which is a criteria I, um, sorry, a criteria L, um, which identifies um, and refers to the zones of influence. Those um, those zones of influence um, have been <coughs> developed from updated visitor surveys that were carried out in 2021 um, as part of the um, evidence base to support to support this local plan. Now, um, they provide updated evidence, which um, effectively updates the evidence that was um, produced in 2010 when the original SPD um, was brought forward and which informed the strategy that is set out um, in that SPD. Um, and the, 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 the main difference really is that um, the zone of influence doesn't cover the full full extent of the Whitford Urban expansion. So, so in summary, and um, as set out in 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 the appendix to um, the Mass Three statement, where um, some detailed discussions have happened with Natural England about this um, zone of influence and the amount of sang that's required per population, etc. Um, overall, that it's it's estimated at the current time that sort of the total amount of provision is is less than was required at the time um, when it was being considered through the original SPD as a result of those revised zones of influence. So in the council's response, um, we set out um, in table three, that sets out, oh sorry, it's not table three, wrong table. It is table four, table four on page 12. We set out um, a an estimate based upon um, how we think the development is going to come forward and the amount of development that will come forward within those zones. Clearly, that is an estimate and that will be, you know, the detail of that and the precise amount will be a matter to be dealt with through through the uh, revised master planning process um, and also to be considered um, at an individual application level as the applications come in. So um, the council considers that you know, that demonstrates that that it is possible to deliver the required and necessary mitigation mitigation on the site and therefore uh, meet the requirements of the habitats regulations and that the detail of that um, can be secured through the provisions of criteria L of the policy as the master plan and also further planning applications come forward for development on the site. OK, thank you very much. So I'll open this up because I know that um, Hosby's representatives are here today um, and this is a point that they wanted just to to pick up. So I'll go to straight to yourself then, uh, Mr Young, please. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, sir, both of you. Um, 
yeah, the, the position is that the uh, mitigation for Whitfield is very complicated and it is bespoke and it has been designed specifically on the basis of phasing going from uh, east to west <clears throat> with assessment of um, its efficacy starting with phase one which is furthest away um, and then um, from the SAC and then working round. Now, I am joined this morning by the other speaker we've been allowed to, to bring, thank you very much for that, is Alistair Baxter. And Mr. Baxter is an ecologist at Aspect Ecology, and uh, he is a director in the company, and he has been um, involved in this, in the original scheme and now. So um, rather than my words about ecology, it's probably better if you will permit him to just explain how the mitigation that was agreed um, uh, is, in effect works, because um, how it works is the point. Um, it is not possible on the basis of the current understanding with natural England to then start in other places. That isn't what the um, that isn't what the agreed position is and what was agreed with with natural England. So if you'll permit him. Could, could he explain his involvement and how the mitigation works? Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that, but only in the context then of why the plan is unsound, so in the context of the policy, um, because in the, the, the policy, so policy requires a, a revised master plan, you know, whether that's a, a master plan, SPD, we've, we've sort of um, discussed that previously, and within the policy it says do a revi revise master plan and then as part of that there's criterion i which sets out um you know necessary um mitigation that's needed so yeah happy to hear that that's absolutely fine um but just in the context of why the plan is unsound then and okay. and if so why it needs to change okay can i can i just start with that bit because obviously that's yeah. on your mind yeah. um so the plan cannot proceed it is unsound because there hasn't been an appropriate assessment of the newly proposed way of providing the mitigation there is an accepted and agreed way based on the existing spd and the existing planning permission which implements that we have saying you've seen the large green area that runs through the sites as you come off the roundabout you'll see those green areas so that mitigation is obviously acceptable within the current existing plan. It is unsound to move to a different form of mitigation, which contradicts that which was previously agreed without appropriate assessments from and approved for, by Natural England, which would be surprising given the importance attached to phase one, delivering phase one and testing phase one because we are dealing here with certainly what in mine and Mr Baxter's experience is a wholly unique SANG. There are dozens and dozens of them, but this one is wholly unique. And the mitigation that was proposed for this is enshrined in the existing arrangements to choose to, to move to something else without an appropriate assessment. Addressing that alternative would be unsound. But I'll hand over to Mr Baxter, if I may, and um, let him explain why it is as it is. OK, yeah, and just explain to me then what, what the differences are then between the two approaches, approach that was advocated when the SPD was done and any mitigation that would now be required. Good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Alistair Baxter. Uh, as Mr Young has indicated, I was part of the original team to bring the Whitfield uh, allocation forward and the SPD in 2011. I worked closely with uh, the developer Natural England and Dover District Council district ecologist who was there at the time to work up what would be appropriate SAC mitigation to safeguard Lydon and Temple Yule SAC, which is just to the southwest. And the southwesterly location is important, sir, in this case, because it is the furthest point from uh, phase one, which is where development started. And the arrangement of mitigation in this instance is a SANG arrangement, but not as you and I will perhaps be typically uh, used to dealing with it in the sense of 
fairly large scale single block uh, provision of around 12 hectares or so, so that it's possible to get a 2.3 kilometre walk in, which is fairly standard stuff now in the south. In this location, the SAC is a slightly different interest feature. It's, it's calcareous grass and it's botany and it's fauna. And so a different form of mitigation was agreed with Natural England, still badged as SANG, but brought forward in terms of parcels of SANG distributed throughout the development and starting in the east with phase one and going around the clock face to the west. And importantly, the concept was that the quantum of, of mitigationary SANG would increase as you went around the clock face. But because the arrangement of SANG is somewhat different in this instance, and it doesn't have that single large block and the, the round walk in it of a you know, needing around 12 hectares to make that work, it's distributed through the development. It was important, Natural England um, felt that each block of SANG was tested and monitored when it was brought forward to ensure it was functioning as anticipated. Because this is not a normal SANG, there is not an evidence base sitting on the shelf which can just be plucked off. Rather, this is completely novel. It's an unusual SANG, certainly not a SANG arrangement I've dealt with anywhere else. And because of that, this um, arrangement uh, is very important. Uh, and, and that process is built into the uh, SPD, uh, which uh, you know is badged a monitoring review and adjustment process. And uh, that, that uh, is set out at uh, paragraph 5.43 of the SPD and, and, and talks the reader through how that is going to work. So it, until the first phase is complete, operational and has been monitored and tested, it's not safe to proceed with the phase two SANG provision because it wouldn't necessarily be known to be fit for purpose because that monitor and adjust process requires the phase two SANG to be updated from the learnings of the phase one experience. And that's why uh, the development uh, proceeds in that um, uh, direction around the clock face, and uh, it's important it does so. Um, Natural England uh, have uh, looked at the uh, revised proposals in this case, and uh, whilst they uh, don't necessarily quibble on the quantum of SANG being proposed, they do have a concern that they raise a flag with still about the details of the design. Uh, of this uh, quality and, and how it will be effective. And, and they make the point uh, that it's critical to be effective. So the design and nature of the SANG will be critical to be effective. And that's on the Natural England letter appended to the, the matter three uh, statement you have, sir. And you'll be aware that the high bar that the habitats regulations uh, set mean that any decision maker, any competent authority needs to be convinced beyond reasonable scientific doubt that the mitigation will work and will be effective. So it's a very high bar and the precautionary principle needs to be applied. So to vary from this established arrangement is uh, a concern and it would need to be subject to an appropriate assessment as a minimum, uh, which naturally would need to be consulted on before uh, there can be comfort that uh, the mitigation would be fit for purpose. Just to assist, sir, uh, there are lots of plans before you, but um, if you have a look at that one, it's the dark green um, is the is the SANG mitigation. And the, the reason that's unusual is you will probably never have seen a SANG like that that runs through the center of the development with built development on both sides. Usually they are separate. I mean, I don't know you may have, but um, it took a lot of convincing in natural England that this would be an appropriate way to mitigate, particularly given against those European tests. Just going back to the question then, so criterion I within the policy um, says that in addition to requirements for open space, SANGs must be provided to mitigate potential impacts upon the Lydon and Temple Ewell SAC. Um, it then includes the calculations on, on size. It then says provision must be phased alongside the phasing of housing delivery. 
and designed to provide a similar visitor experience to designated sites in terms of habitats for use openness as far as possible. So, so, so the concern you had there about the sort of phasing and how it was designed to sort of you said, go, go around the clock phase and, you know, come forward in, in, in chunks. Would that not still occur then? Because the policy as written says sort of exactly what Mr Baxter has, has, has alluded to really, that it must be phased and come forward alongside the phasing of housing delivery. Yeah, the, the council's um, if I may, the council's response um, in respect of these issues is about changing the SPD and having, um, for the purpose of delivery, having an alternative um, uh, arrangement in terms of the delivery. That That's what they're seeking to do now, probably in a master plan. And the difficulty becomes this. Um, it's all very well to say in a plan, well, we're going to have um, sang and that needs to be provided and it'll all be in due course. First of all, this is a matter that should be dealt with through the local plan process. There is a need to carry out um, the uh, through the assessment process uh, full consideration of the impact on European designated sites, as you well know. And that work needs to grapple with the fact that what's being proposed is moving away from what is a specific solution that's been identified in this particular location in this particular context that solution is the one we've explained to you the development um you know the the sheer scale of the development when it was considered by natural england we go beyond the 1250 houses is that the efficacy of the phase one mitigation needs to be tested and verified before agreement over the mitigation for phase two now that's fine if we were proceeding down the raise, the the, uh, um, the route of phase two comes next, um, but the council wants to change all of that. They want to effectively start from the other end to allow persimmon to start. So um, the agreed mitigation that's been put forward for this particular site needs to be revisited through the local plan process, so that. Um, the alternative, which we had understood was not acceptable, um, which is to start closer to the SAC, is then explained. In many ways, once you've already got a solution, if you're going to move to another one, you definitely need to investigate why and how the move to the other one is not going to cause the problems that the first one was designed to avoid. Just on that point, then. So you, you, you said that, that you've got concerns that the council's um, position about, um, you know, essentially letting letting the site come forward then from from sort of other angles and other locations. But from our point of view, looking at the local plan, does the local plan not guard against that in requiring the approval of? Um, a master plan and we're requiring that to deal with phasing and delivery and other policy criteria <coughs> such as criterion I which again relates to phasing and delivery so is there not actually safeguards within the plan that would prevent the things you're concerned about so in the council's response to your matter three and housing allocations issue one dover sites it says phasing and delivery strategy this is a paragraph 38 just for your note there is a need to update the phasing and delivery strategy to provide more flexibility in terms of the order in which the site can come forward you've got a very detailed specific solution that is focused on phase one first phase one being tested its efficacy being investigated before there can be any occupation of phase two. Now the council is saying we want to do away with that solution. We want a more flexible approach in order that other parts of the site can come forward. Now that drives a coach and horses through the whole thing <laughs> that was designed in the first place to deliver an effective SANG in this location. Very close, I might say, to the SAC and in a very unusual way. So 
the desire with of the council to move away from what is a bespoke mitigation to a more flexible euphemism if you like but more flexible approach which is to release other parts of the site that we were where there was a strict understanding should not come forward fundamentally tampers with the agreed mitigation what is the answer the council need to go away and carry out a proper investigation not to say well we'll put this off until um the application is in or there's a master plan or there's a revised spd <clears throat> they need to deal with it now because it it flies in the face of what's already been agreed it should be part of the plan it should be part of the plan and the work behind it it does sorry i was just gonna say because this goes back to um I hate to bring it up again. I think I feel, feel like I've asked this question at least a hundred times, but it's important. This goes back to um, what we talked about on other on other days around. And if you remember the last session, I said, um, "Okay, let's work on the basis that you submitted what you consider to be a sound local plan." The plan as submitted requires a revised SPD, and. And we've talked to, at length, haven't we, around, yeah, essentially the council wants to move away from that for um, for reasons of, of, of efficiency and, and, and moving the allocation forward. And we've heard about you know, how, how long it takes, etc. If the plan was to be adopted with a revised SPD requirement in there, would that not alleviate the concerns you have because presumably then if the council wanted to deviate from the way in which mitigation had been previously agreed that they would have to then substantiate and justify that in order to do so yeah i don't think you're so if i might answer that i don't think questions of european law should be addressed through an spd i just i don't think that's appropriate there needs to be independent scrutiny y yes we can write in and make representations on the spd but there's no independent scrutiny of the kind that you're giving this plan and um frankly it can end up as as largely what persimmon wants it to be um if that's if that if they are effectively writing it and leading on it i mean the correct approach i would suggest is that this matter because we've raised it this matter is then investigated by the council they conduct the necessary um uh, investigation to produce an environmental report that addresses this and addresses in particular why what they're proposing is contrary to what has been agreed through the existing spd and what has been agreed through the planning permission and indeed through um, the obligations attached to that planning permission. The council have said they don't want to do the SPD. That was their move on the one of the first week or the second week. Um, we were concerned, particularly about the SPD, because of the attempts to, well, I've described, you know, colloquially is its extraterritorial dimension, which is to effectively try to impose retrospectively obligations and requirements over houses that have already been built and houses that have already got planning permission. We were happy with the master plan. Um, in truth, what we want is, you know, something that doesn't contradict the existing permission. So if they go back to the route of having an SPD covering an area that doesn't include my client's planning permission, then so be it. And I see the point you're making, you know, doesn't this need to be, but the SPD, and the lack of scrutiny of that isn't a basis upon which to investigate properly a solution to a European designation SAC when one has already been very carefully agreed. The the the, the council have casually said we'll produce an SPD um, and, and then changed it to a master plan and it'll all be sorted out in there. No. These are fundamental issues that need to be addressed through the local plan process. And the council, I, I'm not saying it can't, uh, phase two and three can't be delivered. What I'm saying is council needs to go away and properly investigate this matter and explain why the change in direction, which was forbidden previously, is now considered acceptable. And they need to carefully explain that 
with reference to the existing planning permission in the SPD to Natural England, so that Natural England and accept Natural England accept representations from others before they sign off the approach, which is a fundamental change in direction in the plan making approach for this site. I give way now because I can see others have their hands up. Just just one final question for me then uh, before bringing the council in is. I, I, I take your point around the council's hearing statement talks about um, looking at phasing and delivery. But as far as the plan is concerned, and as far as Natural England are concerned, if this plan was adopted today, it would require under Criterion I um, the provision of SANGs and they must be phased alongside the phasing of housing delivery. So if there was a changed approach in the provision of SANGs, um, would there not be enough um, under the existing policy for the likes of Natural England to turn around and say, well, well, no, this was the agreed approach. Um, we've agreed this is how the SANGs are going to work and everything that Mr Baxter set out. So would the policy not just just deal with that and Natural England could turn around and we'll say, well, no, you, your development plan says that SANGs must be phased alongside the phasing of housing delivery. If you deviate from that, then, you know, you have to come up with a with a good reason because that's contrary to the policy. OK, um, good question. If I may say so, three answers to that. First of all, um, this should be grappled with in the well th first first point is that um you have already been told because of the difficulties we have with the council we're not proposing to bring forward the rest of phase one so what has been agreed and what has been identified won't be able to be completed so that gives a fundamental difficulty in terms of delivery um we've tried to reach an accommodation with the council over the whitfield roundabout but they you know they are where they are and that's the difficulty the second thing is um, that um, there is a real issue here in terms of local plan process. A local plan must produce an HRA. You don't need me to tell you that. But that is not just a tick box exercise. It's meant to genuinely look at the issues surrounding addressing European protected sites. The HRA for this local plan that you're considering does not even begin to grapple with the issues that we've raised, doesn't even go near it, doesn't even identify it, doesn't even recognise it as an issue. That is fundamentally wrong. It should deal with this issue and it needs to deal with the inconvenient truth about what the existing development plan allocation says. And the third thing is all of this, all of this goes to delivery. The plan is highly dependent on this site. I won't repeat anything I've said about that again. And therefore, the delivery of this site is thrown starkly into question. But ironically, the council's attempts to enhance delivery through flexibility fly in the face of an HRA that was agreed for the last plan and the work that's been done on this site, which requires the efficacy of the HRA in phase one to be tested first. Sorry, efficacy of the SANG in phase one. OK, so there's a few points there. So just go back to the council, really. Um, and just again, trying to sort of stick with the with the issue of why is the plan unsound? Um, so Mr. Mr. Fegan. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Um, Connor Fegan, I'm council appearing on behalf of Dover District Council. Um, so, yes, qu quite a number of points to deal with, but um, in headline terms, the answer is really the question that you put to Mr Young um, at the end, sir, which is um, that Criterion L does all that it needs to do in terms of a local plan and, and ensuring that there's adequate uh, provision in there for the necessary mitigation to be provided. And Mr Young's three responses um, to you um, don't address the point. So the first um, response really to that was, well, Criterion L doesn't get you home because phase one 
um, isn't going to be coming forward. And, and we've had that debate around the Section 73, and I'm not going to re-enter the debate on Section 73, but I will say this. If it's the case that mitigation, which is currently secured as part of the Outline Planning Commission, but if we assume for a moment that that isn't delivered in full, then subsequent phases which come forward will be caught by criterion L. They will, as a matter of domestic law, be subject to habitats regulation assessment. There will be consultation with Natural England. And developers bringing forward subsequent phases will need to demonstrate with reference to criterion L and the well-known legal requirements that the signs that they are providing on their phases are sufficient to mitigate the impacts arising. So they will have to wash their own face when it comes to their phases and ensuring that the mitigation measures are adequate. And we know as well that when we're undertaking habitats regulations assessments at the development management stage, that that has to be done on an in combination basis as well. So other phases will be looked at. And the efficacy or otherwise of measures which have been secured through other phases will be taken into account at that level. So the phase one point doesn't um, undermine the efficacy of the policy criterion itself. The second point was there's a real issue in terms of process and the HRA hasn't grappled with the point. And it was said on numerous occasions by Ms Baxter and Mr Young that, that the HRA simply doesn't grapple with it. That's not correct. What the HRA does in standard plan language terms is it identifies a likely significant effect which in this case is a likely significant effect arising from recreational pressure. So it clearly identifies that. It uses zones of influence to do that. And it identifies what the necessary mitigation is. And the mitigation which it identifies is suitably designed signs. And I don't think there's any serious dispute that suitably designed signs are appropriate mitigation measures for recreational pressure. And what it then goes on to say is. Because that is mitigation which is being relied upon, it must be secured in the local development plan. And it's secured in the local development plan through criterion L. Which ensures that at the application stage an adequate amount of sign based on the visitor surveys which have been undertaken and based upon the revised zones of influence will be provided on this site. That's how the HRA is then able to conclude no adverse effects because the mitigation which it's relying upon to neutralise the recreational pressure has been secured in the plan. And then finally, the third point, well, this all goes to delivery. If you accept my two points that I've just made about how all of this hangs together, there is no delivery problem here. It's perfectly appropriate, both in terms of law and procedure, to say in a local development plan, there's going to be a policy criterion that's going to require signs, but the precise design and detail of those signs is going to be worked out through the application stage where there will be project level HRAs and consultation with Natural England. And that's what this plan um, ultimately um, does. In terms of um, the, the, the sort of general point that's being made and, and, and the suggestion that there's some radical change really between what was previously um, agreed in the SPD and what is now being proposed, we don't accept that characterization. Taking a step back again, what the SPD and the core strategy and the evidence base sitting behind that said was there's a problem or a potential problem when it comes to recreational pressure on this SSE from the Whitfield Urban Extension. Just like this HRA, what it said was the answer to that is suitably designed signs. And it set out in a table in the SPD, table 5.5, it broke down where those signs were going to be. And what it said was the design of these signs means that it will all have to be very carefully monitored um, 
in the future. Now, none of that is inconsistent with the approach the Council is now taking, which is again based on signs. And when subsequent um, phases of the development come forward, if Hallsbury Homes is particularly exercised about the fact that some of the signs in the earlier phases might not be effective, which seems to be their main concern. Then when those later phases come forward at the project level HRA stage, they can make those points. And if the points are good points, then more sign will have to be provided on those later phases. None of this is insurmountable um, difficulty in terms of how this is dealt with. This is straightforward um, adaptive um, dealing with these matters at the project level stage uh, with, a, with a clear and coherent policy framework in place. But in terms of the soundness of the local plan, really the key point is all of the evidence base is saying a really straightforward point, which is recreational pressure, you need signs, and there's policy criteria on place to ensure that those signs will be delivered. And that's enough for the, comp for the purposes of the local development plan. Presumably that the, the local plan as well is prepared in uh, in the context and in the understanding that phase one does come forward um, as as planned. Yeah. And, and, and I know that it's sort of, you know, without getting into section 73, I, I know that, that process yeah. is, is, is ongoing. Yeah. And <clears throat> is it the case then that, you know, and, and again, we, we sort of need to hypothesize it is it's important but in the context of let's say that the um the appeal was was dismissed and um, obviously osbury have said that they you know they, they set, set out their position quite clearly is it the case then that if that was the scenario um because at the minute we're sat here we don't know what the outcome of that separate process is going to be and um, yeah. if if that's the case then it is it is it something that we'd have to consider at that time and come back and say, OK, well, you know, you, you prepared a plan in the context of um, this and this existing allocation. You've made it a bit bigger. Um, uh, phase one's got planned permission. Um, and, and that was always the expectation. And a lot of these policy requirements hang off the back of that, including SANGS. The plan has been written in the context of, you know, phase one will come forward and we've done a HRA, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If, the outcome of that appeal was, well, no, Hosby have to contribute X amount of money, which they're not prepared to do. Then almost. Do we have to cross that bridge when we come to it and say, well, actually, we then, then need to reconvene potentially because this is a plan that was written in the context of phase one would come forward. Now, if Hosby's position is, um, well, it's not and it's not going to come forward, then there are these all potentially issues that you'd then have to grapple with and say, OK, what now? What do we do? Where do we go? I, 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 I think um, I, I understand, sir, obviously, that the, the need to, to think about these things and hypothesise. But, um, the, 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 you know, the Section 73 has a number of, 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 of different potential outcomes. And I think it's difficult to say in the abstract as to whether the outcome of the Section 73 appeal would necessitate the reconvening of the local plan um, hearings to discuss um, the potential outcome. Certainly the position of the Council would be um, that the plan um, you know, bef before you is capable of proceeding through the process and, and, and to adoption without waiting on the outcome of the Section 73 appeal. We don't think it's so fundamental that you have to wait to, to the outcome of that before before we can proceed with matters in terms of the HRA and, and the particular context here, which we're dealing with. Um, some of the sang on, on that phase, as I understand it, um, quite a considerable amount of the sang on that phase has already been provided. So this this point about um, effectively hanging over some of the submissions from Hallsbury Homes, which is well, if we don't um, get the outcome that we like in the section 73, 73 appeal, we'll we'll put down the shovels and that's it, and and that will cause a problem for delivery. Um, that that doesn't add up in terms of the sign, um, because a considerable amount of the sign has already been provided. Now let's assume for a moment on the seventy three um, appeal that um, actually um, you know it's an unfavourable outcome for Hallsbury Homes. Um, 
and uh, some uh, part of the sign has not been provided, then what happens quite simply is that when a subsequent application comes forward for a later uh, phase, um, that will have to be um, taken into account if necessary, if, if relevant, you know, it, it may not even be relevant to, to the actual calculation of the mitigation of that particular phase, but if relevant, it, it's capable of being dealt with through the flexibility of the development management process itself um, and through the project level HRA. Um, the outcome of the Section 73 appeal is, is very unlikely to have any bearing whatsoever on the efficacy of the development plan, particularly as it relates to the topics which we're discussing today. Okay, thank you, Mr. Young. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, obviously the council say that they wouldn't possibly want you to think that the section 73 was relevant, but at the moment there's an impasse and we made clear there wouldn't be delivery of the rest of phase one. The arrangements with Natural England mean that the phase one um, uh, saying needs to be completed and let's be clear about it. Um, you, you need the houses built to test the efficacy of a saying because you need the people to occupy them. Uh, so that you can see whether it is working. And obviously each saying has a threshold in terms of the amount of um, residents it can be expected to accommodate in terms of its mitigating effect. So I'm afraid I, I disagree. Uh, I think it is absolutely fundamental. And let's be clear what we're, we're saying here. We're saying that the council should go back and look at the HRA specifically with a, a view to addressing a alternative arrangement that is contrary to what has already been agreed. At the time of the work on the original application, Natural England um, raised concerns about the efficacy. The author of one of the letters said, I remain concerned that the information given does not provide enough detail regarding the quantities of SANG that will be created and how this will effectively replicate the features. Um, as discussed above, the design and nature of the SANG will be critical to its effectiveness. So the work that then led to the planning permission required that to be all uh, arranged. And before phase two, this is critical, before phase two, the efficacy of phase one had to be tested. And um, I'll just hand over to Mr Baxter, if I may, because I think what, what's being suggested here is that it doesn't matter that, that that assessment, that part of the HRA doesn't grapple with this issue. Um, I'll just hand over to him if you're happy with me to do that, sir. Thank you, Mr Young. Uh, the point to emphasise in this regard is uh, the habitats regulations differ from other legislation such as the EIA regs in that they require an assessment of plans and projects and of course in this case we're dealing with a plan and so the HRA needs to be able to look at the principles of the mitigation which is being brought forward is it capable of being brought forward and can there be a conclusion of at no reasonable scientific doubt remains that there's an absence of effects arising. And at the moment, the HRA for the local plan doesn't grapple with the issue of rearranging what's an agreed process of mitigation, doesn't grapple with the issue that the SANG design is novel, it's not tested elsewhere, there's not an evidence base from elsewhere. The evidence base needs to be collected as uh, this development goes forward. And that is why a key element of the mitigation was the monitor review and adjust mechanism that is built into the SPD. And if we take Can away I just that, stop, sorry, okay, just 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 stop in there. Just just a question then. So you you said that the 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 HRA doesn't take into account the sort of revised. We'll call it a revised approach. Yeah. Um, but does and it's here to test that the the the, the local plan. But this goes back to the question I asked Ms. Young. Does the local plan actually um, in any way permit or expressly say that there will be that revised approach? Because the local plan says you can't do anything 
until you've agreed, um, you know, phasing and point L, I was following at point, point I, apologies, it's point L, provision must be phased alongside the phasing of housing delivery. So it, it sounds like the HRA was produced in the context of an understanding of the mitigation that's been been agreed, yeah. And 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 we've talked a lot about well, there needs to be a bit more flexibility. Um, there needs to maybe be a, a bit more of an approach to phasing delivery. But to go back and look at the plan, appreciate your concerns, but does the plan actually say that? I don't think it sets out the order of the phasing, which is what is critical in this particular instance. So well, it says phase. It says phase alongside the phasing of housing delivery, which to me seems to um, to sort of say exactly what you've been saying about. Well, this was the original mitigation. It was you know phase one comes forward. You know you provide these areas of sangs. You then move in a logical order through through the site. And I take your concerns um, and sort of apprehension about what may or may not happen. But from a local plan perspective. <clears throat> I'm still going to understand why the local plan has submitted, and I appreciate that yes, the council have written things in here in statements, but the local plan has submitted. Why would that result in the concerns that you have? I think it's the vagueness at the moment, sir, is that it, it, the statement phased with housing doesn't say where the housing is going to come forward. That the principle of the mitigation in this case, which was agreed in 2011, and, and there was a, a lot of negotiation and discussion and analysis at the time, is that the development starts in phase one, which is furthest from the SAC, the lowest risk location. And so the learnings and monitoring from that phase one development can then inform phase two and so on round the clock phase. So that the highest risk development, which is, is last on the phasing plan, closest to the SAC, has the benefit of all those learnings and any SAC mitigation adjustment, which has been necessary as the development has proceeded round. So it's allowing time for that to occur, which is what gives the certainty because we're not dealing with a standard mitigation measure in this case. Could I just add something? So can I just hold up my SANG plan, if I may, and it was suggested well by Mr. Fegan that it's completed. Um, no, uh, we have the SANG here, if you can see that area here. What we don't have, oops, something's come across my screen, is we don't have the SANG here. Okay. Now, SANGs need to be a certain size. You can't just have a tiny SANG. You've got to have a SANG so you can complete a circular walk or a walk of a certain distance. The solution here was that that particular saying, which is very urban as opposed to being in a rural context, replacing the pressure that normally comes for people using it, should be tested to see if that was effective. And the difficulty I think here, if I can just nail it in one sentence, is that there should be no development on this site. There should be no phase two or three or five or six until that has been tested as an appropriate form of mitigation because if it doesn't work then there needs to be an entire rethink about this and about how it works and this should all be addressed in um, the HRA for the local plan so the HRA would then need to explain why an alternative arrangement is appropriate, why there is no longer a need to test phase one, all of which was agreed, why, um, what shape they're going to take and why they will overcome it when you are so close, so incredibly close to an SAC where people like to walk and recreate and where the problem arises. So you won't have um, anything by way of a solution unless phase one is tested because that's what Natural England wanted in this instance. And we've got no evidence that they're happy with any alternative as opposed to what's been agreed. The chronological sequence was east to west. What's been proposed now seeks to include um, a lot more central and western parts. The very thing, the very thing we were told should not be allowed. Just just to wrap up then, I'll go back to the council, but just, just to wrap up on this issue, 
the, the, the policy requires the phasing to be agreed and it sets that it must be phased alongside the phasing of housing. If an alternative scheme for the provision of SANGs came forward, is there not enough within the policy for Natural England to turn around and say, well, no, this isn't this isn't what was agreed. We agreed you'd do phase one. We agreed that you'd test that and we agreed that you'd monitor that. And that would then inform phase two. So I'm sorry, but your phasing isn't appropriate. We we object, council. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And now the Whitfield plan and the heart of the Dover plan isn't delivered. You've got a plan. I mean, the HRA is not designed to be just, a, as I say, a tick box exercise. It's meant to investigate whether there will actually be an efficient. I mean, you could write an HRA that says we'll do a SANG. It could be one line and that's all. But they don't say that. They investigate the ability to achieve SANG, where it will be achieved, how it will be achieved. And in this case, it would need to investigate why alternatives to that which has already been agreed. And, and that is that is. The challenge point, isn't it? The, the point at which there is an existing arrangement, to what extent did the council investigate an alternative which contradicted the existing arrangements that have been agreed by Natural England? Because there is no evidence to that effect. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Fegan. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you, sir. Um, the you could just just deal with natural England first, because I think one of the points that hasn't been raised, which is quite important um, for for you as a decision maker to take into account, is we do obviously have a statement of common ground with natural England on SAP one in particular, um, and they raise no issue with SAP one. So they have natural England has looked at this. It's looked at the HRA um, and the points which are being raised are not points which are of concern to natural England. And we know um, uh, the, 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 the standard position that when you are in HRA territory in particular, you are entitled as a decision maker to give very significant weight to the views of Natural England on these matters, um, absent cogent reasons um, to the contrary. So the, the very fact Natural England are not raising the objections which you are hearing um, is something which is, is quite important to bear in mind. Uh, the uh, points which are being raised really about the sang uh, are quite detailed points, not about the principle of the approach which the council is taking. Um, and by the principle of the approach, I mean this, that um, there is recreational pressure identified as the likely significant effect and signs are identified as the solution. No one is seriously disputing that as a principle which is acceptable. The local plan through Criterion L then gives some teeth to that by ensuring that at the development management stage, there's adequate provision in the plan for the council to insist on those signs to be in place and for Natural England to raise an objection, as you've put it, sir, if they are so minded to do so. The very detailed points which, you are, which are being raised around, well, what's the design of the sign, the very design of the sign going to look like in the letter from Natural England that Mr Young read out, which is talking about well, what particular species are going to be there and habitats, et cetera. Those are classically matters which are more appropriate for a project level HRA and consultation with Natural England at a project level. It, it would be highly unusual within a local development plan and a policy like SAP1 for it to say anything more than it does say, which is you need to deliver signs and this is the broad quantum which has to be delivered. Um, it, it would be very unusual for it to go to the level of detail which is being suggested by Halsbury Homes um, in the representations to you. Now, the, the, the point about efficacy as well has to be properly understood in context. So if we assume for a moment that um, on a hypothetical basis, let's assume that one of the um, later phases comes forward, so it's not in the um, east west east west basis that um it, it, it is being argued um it, it should come forward um what will happen is criterion l will bite they will have to provide sign in accordance with criterion l on the basis of the hra which has been undertaken that is thought to be enough to mitigate however as part of that, as I explained, the legal requirement at the project level is to undertake a HRA and to undertake it 
um, with mindful to other projects which have already come forward. So if there is a particular concern that Natural England has, for example, that, well, hang on a second, uh, we're not sure that this is going to be effective, or hang on a second, we're not sure that the phase one SANG is actually effective. That is a matter which is thrashed out through a project level HRA at that particular stage. But there is nothing unusual about that pr process being followed and that being dealt with more appropriately at that um, stage. It, it's really a case, sir, of what more can the what more can the local plan do here? Um, and as you've pointed out, sir, criterion L really goes as far as it can go in that last sentence where it says provision must be phased alongside the phasing of housing delivery. And the reason why it's saying that phased alongside housing delivery is because ultimately that's what's important in terms of the recreational impacts. It's about phasing the signs in such a way as to ensure that the recreational impacts are mitigated as the various phases of development come forward. And at each stage, the developer will have to satisfy the Council and Natural England that the sign proposals which they are uh, uh, proposing and the design of those are appropriate to mitigate the effects arising. Um, and that will be subject to the European law tests at the development management um, stage. But as I said, this is a a standard, a pretty standard development management approach and local policy plan approach, which is taking place up and down the country in terms of um, a policy saying you have to deliver a certain amount of signs and then the detail of that being dealt with at, at, at another point. Mr. Young? Just briefly, sir. Uh, um... It was suggested that you know Natural England haven't objected. Natural England don't object because they've no information of the proposal to change the phasing, as this isn't addressed in the local plan HRA. So they don't they don't know about this. And it's important to be clear about the phasing, um, about where the different phases are in their proximity to the SAC. The, the whole phasing was designed to be away from the SAC and then to deliver it in a particular way. So Natural England needs to be informed of what is proposed, the change of direction. Um, that is not in the council's HRA. It, it is wide open to criticism. Just, just, just finally for me, Mr. Just, just on that point, and, and I don't mean to labour it, but does the local plan change that phasing or change that approach? I know, I know you, you refer to the council's hearing statement and what's been said at these hearings, but does the local plan actually do that? Does the local plan say um, this was originally envisaged and actually you can have this? Yeah, so I'm just I'm just going for my uh, copy of the local plan and um, I have to look at the precise well, I mean, your point is, although the council are saying these things in their hearing statements, you know, it isn't actually part of the plan to change the phasing. Yeah, I mean, um, first point is, you know, you shouldn't be saying in hearing statements things that are contrary to to the plan. Uh, that's that's a challengeable point. But um, as far as the um, the actual oops, the actual policy is concerned, if I just turn that up. Um, Yeah, provide an, up an updated phasing and delivery strategy. So they want to change everything. That That's in the second paragraph of the policy SAP 10. So they want to change the phasing and they want to change the delivery. Up update means change. And they want to change the fundamentals of what's been already agreed. And, and I would say it's a bit like the CPO inquiry that did last summer, the one that got quashed was that you don't have to provide viability evidence to justify a CPO, but in that case, the council had viability evidence, and therefore you can't unsee what you've already seen in the inspector quash the CPO. In this case, you can't pretend there isn't an existing arrangement for the SANG 
and say oh, it's just a blank canvas and this is like anywhere else and they'll just provide a saying there is a bespoke solution in very unusual circumstances that's been identified you cannot unsee that and you cannot ignore it the hra needed to grapple with the intention of changing the whole dynamic and provision of the saying and the policy is making clear that they do want to revise and change consistent with their hearing statements the whole way in which this development comes forward and indeed that's the whole reason we're here mr vegan any comments on that yes um i i, I fear i'm repeating myself and making what i think is quite a, an important basic point which is um, the characterization of the council having fundamentally changed what it's doing in terms of the uh, habitats regulations and the mitigation for this site is simply incorrect on any fair reading of the documents. As I went through, when you trace through, sir, um, the SPD, the habitats regs for the old plan and trace it through to what's being done now, the basic approach is the same. And it's that there is an impact identified recreational disturbance and SANG is the solution. That has always been the approach. Yes, the original SPD set out um, uh, precisely how that was going to be done. Uh, the, so the, the local plan now before you on the basis of revised zones of influence, uh, which have been undertaken as a result of visitor surveys in 2021 and slight differences in terms of the quantum of development mean that the amount of sang is slightly different, but the overall approach has stayed the same throughout and um, there has been no fundamental change to that. Now, um, the design of the sangs is something which is, um, th th there was a green infrastructure plan associated with the SPD and the design of the sangs is something which was always going to have to be looked at at the application stage. The idea that the detail of sangs can be fixed at plan level or SPD level and would not be subject to detailed consideration, debate and consultation with Natural England at the development management stage is simply incorrect. It's not what the SPD does. It's not what the core strategy did. Um, and it's rightly not what this plan is doing either. So, sir, I, I would urge you to, to when you do trace it through in that way, and the characterization which ultimately lies behind the submission being made this morning that there's some radical change in, in approach from the council that requires detailed hra um, is unsustainable on the facts there is a paragraph in the plan actually um, and it's in the supporting text to sap1 it says that currently this is paragraph 4.74 on page 105 yeah says the currently adopted SPD required phasing the site to follow an east direction around the existing settlement of Whitfield, some of the things we've talked about. Whilst this phasing and development is most likely due to delivery of the main piece of highway infrastructure, the updated phasing and delivery strategy does not need to strictly follow this pattern if it can be demonstrated that each phase can be delivered with the necessary infrastructure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the context of SANGS, this is what we're talking about yeah. today. Yeah. Um, I think bluntly has has that point, and I think it's maybe the point that that Miss Young was getting to me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but has that point been lost then on yeah. Natural England and the HRA authors? No, yeah. it 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 it, ha it hasn't been lost on them, sir, for this reason, which is um, that sentence hangs together um, when it's read um, uh, fairly. What it is saying. Uh, is simply that the phasing doesn't have to strictly follow the pattern, but this is the important part. If it can be demonstrated that each phase can be delivered with the necessary infrastructure. So if we translate that into habitats regulations language, it is saying that although the original uh, phasing uh, follow that east west direction, if it can be demonstrated that there um, is some other way of doing it and that that is consistent with the delivery of the necessary infrastructure, in this case, the delivery of suitable signs, then there is no objection to that either in law or in principle. So as I explained, if, for instance, a later phase, if I can put it like that, was to come forward first, 
We're not suggesting that is going to be the revised phasing because that's a matter which will have to be worked out in due course. But if a later phase did come forward first, ultimately what would have to be demonstrated is that the um, sign being delivered as part of that phase was sufficient to mitigate the adverse effects. Now, if it was the case that Natural England was not content and took the view, well, um, this isn't good enough, um, we don't think uh, the efficacy of this has been established, then that is something that's dealt with under Criterion L and their suitable policy control for that. But it would be wrong to foreclose the possibility that an applicant could come forward and conceivably demonstrate that they are providing adequate sign, both in terms of quantum and quality, such that there was no impact from recreational disturbance from that particular development. That's perfectly appropriate. Yes, the uh, east-west clock, clock face approach on the SPD was a way of doing it, but it's a way of doing it. It's, it there, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest it's the only way of doing it. It was a single way of doing it back in the SPD, but now um, the plan is saying there is the flexibility built into the process as we have discussed and, and went through in various sessions, that if someone comes forward and is able to demonstrate consistent with criteria on ale to the satisfaction of both the Council and Natural England, that there will be no adverse effects on designated sites. There is absolutely nothing objectionable about that as a matter of habitats regulations. OK, Mr. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I can't believe what I'm hearing, really, <clears throat> which is to sort of somehow suggest that this whole policy for the urban uh, Whitfield urban extension isn't actually going to be that much of a that much of a change. I mean, the wording of the policy, you asked me to, to, to focus on that. So the second paragraph. A new revised supplementary planning document where well, you, you wouldn't need anything if you weren't changing it. So they want to produce a new document now might be a master plan will be required incorporating the proposed extension of the site. Fine, that's fine, but it doesn't stop there. This will set out the quantum and distribution of land uses, access, sustainable design and layout principles, in addition to providing an updated phasing and delivery strategy for the whole site, for the whole site, not, not the extension, which is the basis upon which the policy might be restricted, and we couldn't complain about that, there's intended to be an updated phasing and delivery strategy for the whole site. So let's not pretend that there's no change here or nothing's going to happen. The whole reason for SAP1 is for an extension and for changing the phasing and delivery of the whole site. Simple as that. Now, Natural England have not been uh, told about um, it, it said, oh, well, they haven't objected. They've seen that. Where is the engagement where there is a discussion and a detailed consideration of what the current arrangements that were agreed are and how those are going to be altered and varied and changed so that we have a um, habitats regulation assessment that reflects the updated phasing and delivery strategy for the whole site? Because that isn't in the HRA. And, and just on the phases, sir, I, the, my client is um, obviously in this format. We have to communicate by WhatsApp. Um, phase four is the one nearest the SAC. Um, so we're clear about how the phases sit relevant to the SAC. Okay, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. I just wanted to come in um, in relation to the consultation with with Natural England. Um, and um, you'll see us set out in the statement of common ground that the council have um, consulted with Natural England, you know, throughout the, the plan making process um, and discussed um, relevant matters with them. Um, 
the council considers that you know natural England is fully aware you know it's written in the policy as Mr Young has said that we're considering a different delivery and phasing strategy that's in policy SA P1 so that you know that's clearly in front of natural England um, they've commented on on the plan in detail and they've commented on the HRA in detail um, and so the council considers that you know through the plan making process that natural England are aware of, of these matters and they have considered them fully um, and, you know, in, on the basis of the information that is, you know, published and, and set out in front of us. What, 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 can I just respond to that just in one sentence? Natural England have a lot to do. They're presenting with huge amounts of information. There's a very limited number of staff. It's one thing to say, here's the policy. Is this fine? Yes, we'll do some sayings. It's quite another to highlight, as they should have done, and rem it might be completely different staff compared to those who worked in 2010, may very well be, to actually make the point very clearly, these are the current arrangements, this was what was agreed, the completion of phase one was considered necessary. Phase four, Persimmon would like that to come forward, it's the closest to the A2, so there's the access in, new access arrangements. What, why then not say to National England, look, this is what we're proposing. We're aware of the current arrangements. We're, we're, we are aware, this is the Council to Natural England, we're aware that phase one uh, needed to be completed. The SANG needed to be subject to review and monitor. And therefore, uh, we recognise that that is a problem. The reason and how we're going to overcome this with phase four, which we accept is the closest to the road and closest to the SAC, which we accept you said last time wasn't acceptable and is the very last place that you should be developing because of its proximity to the SAC. We appreciate all that, but the solution to that is this. OK, none of that actual engagement. It's one thing to send people a copy of the plan. It's quite another to positively engage specifically in the issue. And our point is this. There is no evidence that that issue has been grappled with at all when it is absolutely fundamental to the delivery of Whitfield. Okay, any final comments from the council this want to wrap it up and, and move on really? Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to come back on Mr Young's comment about phase four and the proximity of that part of the site to the SAC um, and the phasing, that there is absolutely nothing in any of the documentation the council produced to suggest that that is the part of the site that will be coming forward first, or that is what the delivery and the updated phasing strategy will be, as set out in the policy. The revised master plan or SPD will set out what, you know, we'll look at that delivery and phasing. That That is not, there is no specific proposal here. There's nothing to say it's going to divert that much significantly from the current phasing. But the council is proposing to, to add some flexibility, but there is absolutely nothing to say that that's the way it's going to come forward. And as uh, Mr. Fegan has already, already said, you know, given that the detail of the mitigation and the way that's phased needs to be dealt with at, at the next stage, as is required by the criterion in the policy. OK, points noted. Thank you very much. Um, one question, Ms. Waitley, Ms. Waitley, sorry, I know that you're there. You had your hand up right at the very start. I saw your hand go up, but then it's it's come down. So I'm assuming that you didn't have anything to, to add on, on this may, particular. I've, I've found this discussion to be very salutary, very informative. Um, and as the bones of contention of the different developers of SAP1 have been aired, then it's confirmed a number of points we want to raise on the subject of strategic policy 13 but maybe it would be better to move on um inspector if you prefer and we'll uh, we'll raise them as s strategic policy 13s discussed yep yeah, okay if there's nothing else from anybody on that issue like i said that was a sort of a, a mop up really from um from week two and um, that says obviously lots of Mr. Coyle and I to, to sort of grapple with there, but appreciate your um, you know, your your thoughts and input into that one. Um so we'll we'll take a break. Um we'll take a break, but we'll come back. We'll then hear from Ms. Sullivan, um, who couldn't get online yesterday, and then we'll move on with the remainder of the um of the policies around 
um, the matters to discuss today. So we'll take a break and we'll resume back at 11.40. Is that OK for everyone? Yeah. OK, thanks, everyone.